loving what you're hearing? Well, the establishment hates it. And right now, they're conjuring up new ways to try and censor RCR. To ensure you never miss a beat of the hard-hitting news you've come to know and love, make sure you're on the RCR mailing list. Get connected now at realitycheck.radio forward slash email. Now it's time for Cam's Buddies. This week, we'll find out what they think about last week's budget now that all the hoo-ha has quietened down. My producer has them all lined up and ready to go. Let's see what Cam's Buddies think about last week's budget. Was it good? Was it bad? Or was it ugly? Welcome to Cam's Buddies, Jimmy. Good to have you back. G'day, mate. What do you got this week? What subjects are you chucking out there? Yeah, well, we, last week, of course, um, while the, we were on air, the budget was delivered. And we've had a week to think about it now. Uh, What are your thoughts on the budget, good, bad, or ugly? Uh, I don't think the budget went hard enough, quite frankly. I I think we still needed to cut the government down a lot more. A small state is a good state. So, because as it turns out, apparently Nicola Willis's budget is bigger than Grant Robertson's last budget. So, how does that work out? And borrowed more too. Yeah, so I... I guess they're going to have to go bigger to finish everything that they Labor sort of started and then start to get the economy growing and then shrink it from there. Well, there was but a lot I, of... I don't think they find enough bureaucrats. Well, no. I mean, the Taxpayers' Union got in trouble for having a little stunt in Parliament where they um, you know, created a, a pile of boxes and each box represented a 1,000 <laughs> civil servants. And, you know, the, the dramatic, you know, oppressive cuts of 4,000... Uh, staff from the civil service is uh, is this tiny little pile of four boxes versus this massive pile of, you know, 100 boxes or something like that. It was just an incredible um, video to see that. And so I agree with you on that. I don't think they cut it enough um, from the civil service. No, I I saw that box video. That was was a really amazing graphic of how, and I implore anyone to actually look at that to see how big our government is. And You'd think that they're laying off half the government the way the media and everyone's going on. I mean, it's insane. They're, they're, they haven't even chopped the government back to six months before before the election. You know, the so, Romans the Romans had a term called decimation. It's where our word come the word in the English language comes from. That was when uh, some of the legions had been a bit out of control, um, been doing some naughty things. The commander would uh, order a decimation of the legion. And uh, they'd have groups of 10 people and um, they would draw lots. And uh, if the person got the short straw, so to speak, they were beaten to death by the other nine members of the group of 10. Um, And it was apparently a way to increase morale in the legions. And I've always maintained that a metaphoric decimation of the civil service would be a good idea. And then once we do that, we then do it again a year later and chop another ten percent out of the out of the civil service. Well, as long as it's metaphorical, I completely agree. But um, yeah, we don't want to yeah, beat just, people to death to... just because they're a civil servant. No, I mean, no. you know, <laughs> unless they're the, the IRD. I oh, know can't do that either. <laughs> Half of Wellington is, is employed. Central Wellington is employed by them, so they just get get fired from one department, go to another. Yeah, that's the problem, I, isn't it? Isn't it? Unless we break up Wellington and change the culture, I, 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 we've talked about this before, but I just don't see how we can do it. But I, I heard someone comparing it the other day to the Hunger Games in Wellington. I mean, for God's <laughs> sake, they're a bunch of drama queens. If I, drama llamas. Drama llamas, as Ali yeah. likes to call them, drama llamas. Um, what, well, about the, what about this claim? You, know, you hear the media, they're saying, how are you going to pay for the tax cuts? There's this assumption in the media, also in the Labour Party, that tax cuts have to be paid for. I don't know about you, but when I went to school, if you stopped taking money from someone, you didn't have to pay for it. You just stopped taking it. You just let people keep their own money rather than actually taking it from them. But the the socialists always like that. Yeah, the socialists think that they know how to spend your money better than you. Yeah. It's so boring listening to the socialists. How are you going to pay for that? Well, you're just going to let, let them keep their own money. The tax brackets had to be updated. It was insane. You had you know, low-wage workers in a, in a higher tax bracket than they should. Labor should have been supporting the tax raises. But you, they'll never give enough money, those guys. You could give them billions and billions, and they'll never be satisfied. 
I reckon that the so, the government should have a statement for every taxpayer uh, that you know divided that equally, and it says, uh, well, "This is how much money we take in taxes. This was taken by." X number of taxpayers, there may be companies, there may be individuals, it doesn't matter, a taxpayer is a taxpayer, and this is how we spend that money, and here's your statement on how that is, and if we just say that each taxpayer is equal, then, you know, this is how much money was was paid for by taxpayers, and this is how much is taken, and so you can see here we've got a little bit of a deficit here where we've taken um, money from you, but we've spent more than we've taken, and that's in a bright, big, bright red, bold colour, and that's how much is going to be added on next year, the tax to, to, to the spending, because we have to fund that somehow, and that's through borrowing, which means that we're going to need to take more taxes. And I bet you if they provided an itemised taxpayer's account every year uh, at the end of the financial year for the government, there might be a bit more clamouring about some of the useless things that we spend money on. No, what I reckon they should do is it, it, there's no PAYE. Everyone just pays their own tax at the end of financial year. So you got the government asking Joe Bloggs to pay them twenty thousand. They just won't. They'll be horrified, and people will want to lower tax instantly. That's why PAYE is so dangerous because your money gets taken off you by your employer. It's it stealth. hides the fact that a little bit, a little bit every week. But I in call parts it of a... America, you pay it as a lump. And yeah, I call it in America. A... They hate taxes. Yeah, I call it a, a slavery tax because the wage slaves um, get taxed uh, just for breathing, basically. And then the government yeah. takes that so, money, spends it on ridiculous things, and uh, and says to us, it. "Yeah, exactly. It's just it's incredible the waste." Fifty million on on the Auckland supposed bicycle bridge. What? Fifty million? Yeah, insane. Yeah. And what have we got to show for it? Nothing. Not even a cabinet minister that we can blame anymore because he liked to hide his share. I think they own a few of the properties on the other side of the Harbour Bridge, but mm. still, just, it's, just, but balmy. It's nuts. It's completely nuts. There's, there's inane spending everywhere, you know. Uh, my bugbear, my perennial bugbear, is how much money we spend on the Royal New Zealand Ballet and the Symphony Orchestra, you know. Um, <laughs> Why didn't they fund themselves? Right, give people a, a Netflix subscription to watch the ballet channel if there's such a thing, and Spotify accounts to listen to classical music. We don't need to have subsidised seats. I think the subsidy for the symphony orchestra, you know, for every uh, dollar that a person pays for a seat to go and watch the symphony orchestra, um, the taxpayer pays another twenty dollars on top of that, or some some. It's a ridiculous number. Well, have you looked into it to who is the train? <laughs> it's like $220 I mean, a seat. Right, why, don't, why didn't they just give the 10 people who want to travel from Hamilton to Auckland each day a free Tesla? Just buy 20 auto-drive Teslas and shove them on rotation. It'd be still cheaper than that slow, <laughs> clunky thing. It keeps breaking down. I mean, it, it was always <laughs> doomed when they named it after an extinct bird. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, that's the thing. That's just such waste and such disrespect to taxpayers who have worked productively to pay that tax. But I see the media out but, there saying, you know, that the, that the national government's broken a promise, the election promise. When when did we ever see them say that Labor broke an election promise? You know, they didn't say anything when they when they didn't even build a single millimeter of track to the airport. Was that a broken promise? No, because Labor kept promising it and kept promise on the never never plan. Well, you know, the public interest journalism fund buys you a lot of loyalty. Yeah, it buys you a lot of silence too. I see the media yeah. are finally waking up to the carry on and to party Maori. It took them a week. Yeah, but it was because ZB finally ran something on it. Yeah, it's because because to, Thomas Kremner wrote wrote something about it and. And and Bryce Edwards wrote an article about it, and then of course says Hymona Gray has written an article about the fiefdom of John Tamahiri. So it's all non mainstream non mainstream people, uh, the ones that are to breaking be fair, the news. Andrew Barnes did write a great article on it in the Post. Yeah, she went in quite hard on it. Which yeah, but credit to her because I don't give her much credit. Not much at all. But she, but you would think it would be on the news. We can only hope. 
But, of course, it'll be swept under the carpet. It's okay when Maori do it. Well, it's something very fishy going on there. Mm. So it gets washed out. But I, did, did you see David Seymour's tweet that he wants the media to yeah, I did. challenge yeah. the media to treat the Māori Party as any other party, which is yeah. so true. It is true. But I also it's, saw um, David Seymour on a video where he was asked, oh, you know, what are we doing for Māori? And he said, oh, the same as every other New Zealander. That's the budget is for every New Zealander, not just Māori. And um, I thought that was a, a brilliant statement that he made on that. Yeah, so anyway, the budget. I thought the budget was good. It was sensible. And I thought that the tax tax was good, you know, like right step in the right direction. But I'd mm-hmm. like to see a shrinking of the government, you know. I mean, it's expanded but, so, so hugely over the last six years. I would have thought taking 40% it back. 40% more. Ta- yeah, uh, taking, it, taking it back to... 2017, uh, the year 2017, and saying, right, well, anything that was added since then, unless it's absolutely um, essential, it's gone, and that would have been the end of it. But they didn't have the courage to do that. Well, when you get attacked by the media, why isn't the media helping them celebrate? There might be more more money for the media. You never know. Oh, well, they'll all die. We'll keep going. Yep. So that's it. That's my thoughts on the budget, Cam. It was good. But I'd yep. like to see some more action. But, but you know me, I'm never satisfied, mate. Never satisfied. Hardcore right wing act voter. <laughs> you better head yep. off and, and better action. head off and chuck a barbecue, uh, a baby on the barbecue. <laughs> right, mate. talk next week, Ken. <laughs> see you, mate. Welcome to Cam's Buddy Smiles. Good to have you back. Yes. Good afternoon. How are you today, Cam? Fantastic, as always. You know, it's show day. I'm always energised on show day. Excellent, excellent. Uh, yeah. I mean, so, I so, hear we're uh, talking about budget matters. Yes. Well, that's what I thought. I just uh, got off the phone from Jimmy. The question I'm posing is, what did you think of the budget? Was it good, bad, or ugly, or some other descriptor that you might like to use? Well, I'd like to call it a good start. Yeah, that's what Jimmy and, said too, um, a good start. Um, I'm kind of pleased that tax cuts didn't get lost because I am absolutely sick of all this um, high marginal tax rates and the, and the creep that has occurred and the fact that um, people are earning on basically on the minimum wage <laughs> are on quite a high marginal tax rate. What's that? It's crazy. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah, bracket creep. It's an insidious uh, thing, bracket creep. It's where people start on a particular wage or salary and they're at a tax bracket and then through inflation and uh, pay increases, they slowly creep up into the upper bracket uh, and end up um, paying a higher tax rate. And, you know, they don't. there's no adjustment for that. Uh, it's one of the most insidious things that happens in the tax system. Of course, Labor never adjusts the tax brackets um, when they're in government and National are reluctant to. Yeah, and I think the tax brackets need to be adjusted. I think all very well, you know, a little tax cut, and I mean a little tax cut, is always welcome. But reality, there's a structural problem with the brackets and they need to be addressed. And I know why governments are reluctant they need the cash. Let's be quite honest. They're desperate for the cash right at this moment. Well, that's because they spend like drunken sailors on all sorts of um, useless stuff that nobody in their right mind would pay for, but somehow governments come up with a, a better way of spending our tax dollars. Yeah. Um, well, I was looking at the budget and I was thinking that, you know, there is room for some um, more cuts to um, the public sector, and I think they need to be long and hard. I think Argentina has shut down ministries, and I think we need to shut down a few ministries. I mean, do we need all these ministries? I mean, honestly, uh, I just think that quite a few ministries could be rolled into one, and um, you don't need to have all these government departments looking after this, that, and the other, all with a chief 
executive in excess of $400,000 a year, all with a staff. I just think that the government needs to get real and needs to actually realise that they need to cut their cloth according to their income. And they're not doing that. Or, or should I say, it's a good start. They are starting to realise. Um, certainly a lot better than the last crowd, which was, frankly spe- speaking, their budgets where they budgeted for Farm Act and then suddenly magically stopped the funding halfway through a budget cycle. How the hell does that work? Well, I don't know, but what I found interesting was um, it was on Twitter, and I know you are sort of a technophobe, but there was a video on Twitter. <laughs> there was a, a video on Twitter of um, a whole lot of clips from um, from you know, Vox Pops, they call them, where they go out and stick a camera mm-hmm. in, in somebody's face and ask them what they thought of the budget, uh, and they uh, they discussed the tax breaks that the Labor government had had done, which were smaller than the tax cuts uh, that Nico Willis has delivered, and asked people what they thought. And there were, people were waxing lyrical. It's like, oh, this is fantastic. This means so much to me on a benefit, da 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 da, da. And then what it would show is um, the Vox Pops from 2024. And people were going, oh, yep. it's miserable, it's disgusting, you know, it's not enough, and all of this sort of thing. And this is what our media are doing. And somebody's created this video, and it's it's very, very interesting to see the difference in, in how things are perceived or or the way people perceive them is, is because the media manipulate them. Yeah. I think it's the way things are portrayed by the media. And I, I think that's very unfortunate, but it's a fact of life in today's society. The media can't be trusted. They're... Um, the mainstream media, that is. That, that's why people um, flock to this station and listen to mm. this station, because at least they can get two sides of a story, and at least they are hearing what the people are saying who are being interviewed, not what the interviewer thinks should be the uh, situation or the, or the opinion. I mean, the reality is, uh, let's be quite frank, the media has... Um, gone all out to portray this budget as something that it isn't. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you know, the, the way they um, stupidly uh, confront ministers and then say, how are you going to pay for the tax cuts? You know, it, like, like, it, like the government actually pays for tax cuts. No, the government is taking less from taxpayers and then what they have to do is then cut their cloth according to their income. Correct. And, you know, the one thing that I just wish central government would do, and that is force the local government to cut their cloth according to their income, because I, for one, uh, might be very sick of bracket creep and, and, and paying very high marginal tax rates. But I'll tell you what, that's nothing compared with the prof- profligate spending of local bodies. Anyhow, that's a whole other topic, and perhaps I won't rip the top off that one. No, we could uh, we could spend all night talking about the uh, vagaries of socialist spending in city councils, uh, and everyone thinks that's all right. The ratepayers will pay. Well, the ratepayers are you and I. Yes, yes. And the same thing goes for um, taxpayers. Yeah. And people put their hand out for the oh, the government should pay. Well, the government is you and I. It's taxpayers. Yep, and, and that's uh, what I think. Yeah, totally. we pay, and that's why I say this budget is a good start. I think that if they can work on the brackets, if they can work on reducing the um, overwhelming inefficiencies in in the public sector, I think that that would be a good thing. I think uh, they could go so much further. Argentina has showed us what happens when whole ministries get disbanded. I'll tell you what happens. Suddenly, the government spending is cut and suddenly the taxpayers are, are getting a value for money and the government can actually leave the money in the pockets of the people that earn it. Now, let's be quite clear. You and I earn our money. We go to work, do a job, earn it. Now, I'm sorry to say that we are paying for uh, quite a few services that I believe 
uh, are a total waste of money, and that needs to stop. The problem with government is that uh, they always come up with a new way to fill a trough up. In fact, if they can't find a trough, <laughs> if they can't find a trough, then they'll make a new trough and they'll call it something else, but it'll be filled nonetheless. That's the yep. problem. You know, uh, a good government is a tiny government, in my view. Um, you know, they need to get out of our way. And, and you forgot to say that the trough is filled with taxpayer dollars. Yeah. Governments produce and, nothing. Correct. And they cost you know, everything. If, if the government could make the public sector smaller, reduce the regulations. Now, I'm all for Seymour getting out there and cutting regulations, but I cannot see how that has happened in, in this period till now. But let's return to the budget. Okay. Nicola Willis, she delivered tax cuts. Yes, I think it's a good start. I think the budget showed some responsibility where they have looked at the deficit and how they could pay off the, the profligate spending of the last Labor government sooner rather than later. I think all of this is a good thing. I think, you know, if you looked at income tax brackets, that's what I'd go. And I think I'd look at how to trim um, public spending even more if I was Nicola Willis. So what, what would you describe a budget? You said a good start. It's not bad. It's not yep. ugly. It's a good start. Yeah. And I think there needs to be a lot more done. But it's the first step on what I believe is a long um, road and we need to actually front up and make sure that the productive sector gets more of their own money in their own pockets. Yeah. Well, on that I agree and thank you for calling the crunch and we'll be uh, hearing from you again next week on Cam's Buddies. Thanks, Miles. Thank you very much, Cam. Have a good one. We'll catch you later. Okay. Good evening, Lindley. Welcome to Cam's Buddies. Good to have you back. Yeah, hi, Cam. It's great to hear from you again. Well, yeah, it's becoming regular, really regular now, isn't it? You're a big, um, you know, very popular with the fans. They love all of your comments. And this week I thought I'd, uh, yeah, yeah, what I thought I'd do is get your comments uh, from your perspective on what you thought of the budget last week. Was it good? Was it bad or ugly or something else? Well, it was a mix of a lot of things for me. I thought it's a very strange budget <clears throat> by my standards, not by theirs, mm. because it's hard to get realistic numbers from any government, central or local. <clears throat> They've got a language all of their own to start with. <laughs> and creative accounting is the name of the game, really, and I'm not qualified to talk on such fiscal fantasies, really. <laughs> fiscal fantasies, that's a good one. That's an excellent term. I'm surprised we haven't heard that from a politician at some point. Yes, I'll let you use it, though. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so oh, what, fiscal anyway, fantasies, thing... uh, drew, drew, what fiscal fantasies came to your attention? Fiscal ones? Yes. Well, the first one was the word invest all the way through it. Oh, yes. Um, we're, go we're going to invest in this. We're investing $2.9 billion in this. We're investing 400 odd million in that. Uh, the word invest is a complete misnomer in that sense. and Because um, normally with an investment, you actually are aiming for a profit. Or a return but on your investment. <laughs> A return, yes, that's a better word. Um, but for the record, um, I really uh, am not very familiar with all the figures, so you'll have to forgive me on that. But for the record, collective debt, um, however they <clears throat> define that, is $790 billion. Yeah, that's, that's a lot, isn't it? $60 billion, eh? That's a lot of money. That sixty billion dollars rise in one year, and that is not an investment. That's what I call broke. <laughs> so that's what I mean about it's a very strange budget. You know, it's not how you and I would do a budget. What um, would you? What did you want it, to see from the budget? <clears throat> what did I want to see? 
Yeah. I wanted to see them run a proper budget where you address the fact that you're totally overborrowed and have been for decades. And this also applies to to our local council. I want them to own up to having just borrowed and borrowed and borrowed on top of borrowings. And that is one of the main causes um, for the budget being so, um, in, you know, in the red, because you can never really pay back all those numbers, not with compounding interest on it. You know, you're supposed to have compounding interest on an investment, a real investment, yeah. not compounding interest on debt. So that would be the number one thing I wanted to see. I did want to see um, health addressed a bit more and education. Um, I'd like to see landlords completely freed up because that would be the answer to, or a large answer to the housing crisis because things are just too tough on landlords and I know that the media like to pick on them but <clears throat> the fact is that you're not going to buy a house and put a tenant in it if uh, it's totally uneconomic for you and also a pain in the backside. Yeah. Um, you know, I thought, I would think landlords have just run away in recent times because you've got violent tenants that you can't biff out. You've got the bright line test and then, of course, uh, they brought in that interest uh, clause on the mortgages, which was absolutely absurd, but that's gone. So that's yeah, good. And, and the media portrayed that as um, as giving tax cuts to to fat cat landlords. Yeah, well, that's how they um, label them in the media. See, they they stir up hate against anybody that makes any money, uh, yeah. and they always have. But landlords are a, a vital service in providing housing for people. Um, that's as I see it, and. You know, some of the housing um, conditions that they have to meet are totally absurd now. You know, they never stop. And I see that recently um, the ACC did a survey and they said that there should be handrails throughout the house. So that may be next for the landlords if ACC get their way. I reckon soon they'll have to provide a GPS so tenants can navigate their way around the house. It's well, totally you absurd. Want, you wouldn't want get them getting lost from the bedroom to the bathroom, would you? No, you could, wouldn't. It could be awful, the accidents but, but, there, and it could be a slipping hazard as well. That's right. So, I mean, it never stops, and, you know, it's too much. It's too tough for landlords, so then they get out of that market, and then they haven't got enough houses. So it's no surprise, is well, it? What, what annoys me is they, you know, part, the last Labor government passed laws that landlords had to do all of these things, right, which cost thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, it, mm. I think I think there must have been some Labor ministers that had shares in heating companies or insulation companies or something. But anyway, that's what they decided to do. But guess who wasn't required to do that, right? The New Zealand's largest landlord weren't required to do that. Kainga Ora wasn't is that, is required that, to. Is that a fact? It's a fact. They were exempt from doing it for a much longer period than every other private landlord had to. So, yeah. Well, that, it, that's just unbelievable. Well, it's I not can unbelievable. I hardly believe that. No, that's what governments do. Yeah. They, they, they pass laws to impose ideals on, them, on, uh, on the population and they exempt themselves from it. We see it all the time. You know, it's mm. actually almost criminal behaviour what these people do. Oh, I, I just think it's hopeless. I really do. But um, the other thing that um, really annoys me um, is that the, the government in the budget, they've become the chief babysitter in New Zealand. And I notice that they're giving $67 million to teach literacy in schools, which is supposed well, to be taught there anyway. <laughs> and, exactly. Isn't that and, the very reason why we have schools, is to teach literacy? Why do we need to have a special budget item to teach literacy in schools? I have no idea. But just to um, balance that out a bit, they're giving $477 million, which is a reduction 
for so-called healthy school lunches. Now, I'm all for a starved child being fed, but are there really 235,000 starving kids in schools? Well, the question is, well, I don't believe there is because we know this is not the case because during the lockdowns when the schools were closed, who fed the kids? Well, according to that, they must have starved. They must well, have not been fed. Well, that's right. And then, and then, uh, who feeds the kids on the weekend or during the school holidays? Oh, I don't know. I don't but know. I'm surprised there aren't you know bodies stacked ten high at the dump of of school kids that have starved for not being um, fed during the school holidays. Well, this is right. I think their idea is, um, it, and I think the idea is totally absurd, um, that if you feed a starving child, um, they will feel singled out and uh, inferior. So therefore, the answer is to feed everybody. And I just think that just totally ridiculous because, after all, that is going to be the case. Some are going to be starving and most are not. But it's a great opportunity to teach compassion, anti-bullying and resilience, isn't it? Well, you know, when my kids were at school, um, we made them make their own lunches. And so if they had a complaint yes. about if they had a complaint about the lunch, when they could open the fridge, they could go and get the bread, they could get the butter. And we didn't have margarine in our house, I'm not having chemicals like that in the house. You know, they had all the ingredients that they could make a healthy lunch, and they did so. Because if they didn't they went to school hungry. Yes, and I notice all the way through um, all the writings about this stuff um, is tell, telling uh, the school how hard it is and um, making it sort of a three by three by three month plan to get these kids finally onto healthy food. And they're saying things like, oh, well, you know, they're not used to this sort of food and it can be hard to get them to eat it. Well, I'll tell you what, if you had a group of kids in uh, Ethiopia, they wouldn't care whether they were eating hamburgers or or um, sandwiches or lettuce leaves or what it was. Because if you're hungry enough, you'll eat. Well, yeah, the thing is, Usually. I don't know if you've ever seen it on, uh, on TVNZ, they have um, a, a show called Alone where they, they drop um, 10 people uh, to a remote area with uh, a limited amount of equipment and no food. Uh, and one show I was watching a couple of weeks ago, and one of the women in the show was a vegan. And uh, so she was gathering berries and all that sort of thing, and it was all good until um, the snow came, and then there was no more berries. Oh, dear. And then, then she was faced with the with the, uh, the diabolical notion that she might have to catch a fish or, or shoot a, yes. a grouse or, or, or a rat or, or something like that. And so she decided to yep. jack it in. You know, oh, no, I'm going to tap out now because, you know, I don't want to kill anything to eat. You know, yes. this is the, 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 the sookie pants attitude that a lot of these, uh, you know, fussy eaters, I call them, uh, like to foist on other people. They want us to uh, accommodate their personal choices. That, that is correct. And, of course, uh, the fads for what is nutri nutritional anyway, um, it changes about every, well, I suppose every decade, really. Um, it but, jumps from things like vegan to, to carnivore and, and things in the middle, and nobody can decide what really good nutrition is, in fact. And one of the benefits of people or humans is that they can adapt to eating pretty much anything, you know, in any situation. Well, and that's the thing, you but, know, the, the other contestants faced with the same choices uh, decided that their fussy eating habits uh, were uh, to take a back seat to staying alive. And so they, um, you know, caught fish and caught small mammals and ate them because nothing uh, satisfies a growling, hungry stomach like a dead animal. Well, no, survival is everything at the end of the day. But, you know, I can see, um, I mean, I'm sort of uh, more vegetarian than anything, I suppose, not not because it's a religion, just because that's what I've got in my veggie garden. Mm. Um 
but I, I can see a time when you see it's a very warped way of thinking, that, that sort of ideology, and I can actually see the time when people will not be able to pull a carrot out of the ground because you're pulling it away from its friends, you know. Um, it won't well, stop at, at veganism. Well, I, you know, this is the thing I wonder. Do carrots scream when you pull them out of the ground? Do cabbages well, know, because- do cabbages screen when you decapitate them from their roots? I mean, it, yes, well, maybe, my- maybe, maybe we should conduct some research. We get some government funding to conduct some research to find out whether carrots scream. Yes, well, King Charles will help you. Yes, well, he's he, a bit, he'll he's talk a bit, to them. He's a bit, a, you know, a bit crazy, isn't he? He is. But anyway, I've found a really good thing. Um, I've found a good thing in the budget. I've had a good idea. Yep. And the the police budget, I, I give that a big tick. Uh, I don't think it's enough, but at least it's it's something. Two point nine billion extra, which includes purchasing police vehicles. And yes. I just thought instead of instead of the rainbow stuff that's now painted on some of them, why don't they get sponsorship and help pay for them? And I thought RCR might like to sponsor your face cam. You'd look great whizzing around the neighbourhood on a cop car. And everyone looks at a cop car, not like a bus. That's just a nuisance. And I believe you're on a bus. I think you'd get much better mileage on a cop car. What do you then, think? Then, then there'd be you know, endless people on Twitter uh, saying, I saw Cam Slater in the back of a police car. <laughs> yes, but they'd be talking about you, wouldn't they? Well, that's the thing, when, that's the thing isn't it? That, uh, there's no such thing as bad publicity. There's only good publicity. If they're talking about you... They're listening. They are. Winston Peters knows that. Dead right. All right, Lindley, I think we've talked out the budget now. We'll talk again next week. Thanks for calling. Jolly good. See you later. See you. Bye-bye. Good evening, Paul. Welcome to Cam's Buddies. Good evening, Cam. Great to be talking. So, uh, yeah, here we are a week after the budget was delivered. Uh, what's your impressions of it, Paul? Uh, was it good? Was it bad? Was it ugly? Was it something else? Well, I look at the budget and I'm thinking one of the things that everybody was thinking National would or couldn't do, and that was depending on what side of the fence you sat, many people were thinking that they wouldn't be giving the tax cuts because they couldn't. And I think a lot of credibility was revolving around will you and can you? And when you've sort of doubled the size of the public service in the last six years and people are saying, well, if we can cut some of those places back, we'll be back in the right side of the ledger and we can probably do that. Um, And Nicola Willis says, no, we're going to do that and it's a definite. And boy, the number of times she said, it's a definite, we're doing it. She put her hat on the line, and um, and and so when she when when you when you're saying I'm doing this, and you and you throw your hat in the ring, and and your reputation's on the line, um, I was impressed that she did it. Yeah, um, Jimmy was on earlier, and Miles both said that this was a good start budget. That there's plenty more that needs to be done. Would you agree with that? A hundred percent. Now, the things that I think are good is when you when you say we're going to do this as a bottom line and then you do, that's your bottom line and it's been done. Now, everyone's saying, oh, yes, but you've changed breakfast in schools and they, they always want to, like the media want to be the news and trot out all the things you're doing wrong. Well, they won the vote and they won the vote on a, on a like national one on the fact that, that Part of their policy was that we're going to give tax cuts. Now, have they been um, as prudently responsible with if this is, is this the best thing to do with the money? Hard to know. But mm. when you keep your promise, we say, yep, that's good. When you look at what's ugly about it, the ugly thing is then there's a lot of protesters on budget day about something that they haven't even read yet. And it's like when you go and talk to a number of protesters and protest groups and ask them, what, what does this mean? And the number of I don't knows you get is mind-boggling. We were talking about it over the weekend and um, mm. with a few, few of my aviation mates. And they were saying the average Maori with a job 
is happy going to work, happy earning his money, and happy coming home and supporting his family. And so the ones without jobs or the ones with government jobs like the folk in the Maori Party, they're the ones that think, oh, no, let's do, let's, whilst we're drinking on the government, let's protest and kick up Bob's e die. But it's, it's just a few people, but it's ugly to watch and ugly to listen to. What about the contention, the media? I mean, you see the, these, I, I call them fools because there's no other way to describe it really when you see the questions they ask when they say, oh, Minister, uh, how are you going to pay for your tax cuts? Well, that's a very good question, I think, even though they say it in such a manner that they think they, that they're, what they're saying is, what damage are you going to do to poor people? But in fact, what's happened is, if you haven't had an adjustment of where the the tax um, rates change and for what percentage of income, then you're, in theory, wealthy, starts down at between middle class and poor. So that you're on the top tax rate before you know where you are, because it's all moved with inflation. So really, if it hasn't been adjusted for 14 years, everybody's in fact gone down in the in the whole um, situation with where, where the, the more money you earn, you suddenly become rich at, at a very small figure. And so that then where are you going to get it from? As soon as you can look at cutting the public service down, that's a a, a great idea. A, a second thing I see that I, I loved about their new um, new policy of or their more beds in prisons policy, and they're saying everyone's all, all of ready heart to saying, "Oh, that won't do any good. You're never going to reform the criminals." Well, do we really want them reformed? Do we care? Do we just want them off the street so that they're not robbing us and tearing us and attacking us? And I'm just yeah, thinking. I think most people want them, bothering. just want them off the street, not in my street, not near next door to me, not anywhere in public. Lock them up, and we don't care what happens. I think you'll find most citizens who are going about their normal. I mean, and it's quite quite tough out there. Most citizens mm. going about the normal run run of life. What they're thinking is. I don't like being stolen from. I don't like being threatened. I don't like to have people coming and assaulting me. I don't like people attacking me in any form. And so if those people that do that, like the people that break into dairies, I would suggest to you there's less than 100 people that do all the ram raids in the whole country. So if you've got those 100 people off the streets, there won't be another 100 to take their place. Ram raids will cease. Well, that's right. If you take them off the street, I mean, people say, oh, prison's a way that they can get trained. Well, by the time they get to prison, they've committed hundreds of crimes. And I do like the three strikes rule where, you know, if, if you haven't learned after one effort or a second effort, then lock them up and throw away the key. They're not learning. We don't need them in society. We don't need them to to do this sort of um crime amongst the rest of the population when they're just trying to have a nice time. You know, we, we're all just trying to get on. And and lots of hard work and lots of thinking means you can generally um, become a good citizen, having a lot of fun, a good family, and grow good more citizens as your kids. Well, that, <clears throat> that's exactly right. I mean, you know, it, I think the corrections budget, though, is way too high. I'm sure we could run it for a whole lot less. We could outsource it to, I don't know, India or something like that. I believe that um, we we are such a humane place. Having a nice effort is good. And if people want to stay there because it's so nice, but they're not bothering me, I'm okay with that too. And the fact that it costs 100 grand or something per prisoner, I'm certain we could do it for 80. And then I'm certain once we were doing it for 80, we could do it for 60. And so... I hear you that there's a whole lot of ways. I mean, I don't think it costs 80000 to be a prisoner in Fiji. I don't think it costs 80000 to be a prisoner in um, any of these other countries. And so we've got quite a luxurious prison system. But again, um, you were talking last week about in Fiji, the prison system was such that if your family don't bring you food, you don't eat. Well, yeah. I think that, um, you know, then... When the burden for being in jail falls on your family, 
maybe they're more inclined not to encourage you to be in the life of crime where this occurs. And again, it all comes down to good fathers at home make the difference. And I think also we're missing a trick here. We, we keep hearing about global boiling, right, and, and the planet's warming. Why do we need to have heated prisons then? Surely if it's getting warmer, we could just go to tents. I mean, if it's good enough for the army to sleep in tents, well, it should be good enough for prisoners. I hear you. I, don't, I think we, we can't quite get there just yet at small steps. But I think what we can do is say to the folk, if you commit crimes, you're going to jail. And yeah. not, not all the soft targets. Like if you talk to, um, like I had a vehicle stolen just recently and the police said to us, we've got fin- fingerprints of the guy that we know did it, but we can't prove that he didn't steal it and he wasn't just picked up by someone else. And so as such, the case is going nowhere. So clearly they got away with it. And it's a bit annoying. And so my insurance has to pay out um, to repair the car back to the stand that it, that it was. Mm. And so we all lose. And the criminals, because they don't have enough evidence because they set the bar too high, means that um, they get away with it. I had a, um, some tiny houses stolen recently. And when they were stolen, I told the police where they were. We knew where they were. Between yourself and Miles and a few others, we, we detected where they were. We found it all out. We give it to the police. And what do the police do? Say, we'll look into it. We'll get a warrant. A month later, they go and execute the search warrant. And one of them is gone. And we don't know where it is. And that's how sad too bad. We, we knew where it was and we'd seen it when we went and spoke to the police. So they're either so overworked that they can't get to the cases. Hence, they let the cases go cold so that there's more work per case. But you think, if if I can tell you who stole it, where it was stolen from, where it is now, I've done all the detective work, all you've got to do is go there and execute a search warrant, and it takes you a month, eventually we all lose faith. We lose faith, and then we start doing things ourselves because, A, it's more effective, uh, and B, we get results. Exactly. But the crime still occurs because nobody um, has recorded it um, because there's no point telling the police other than for insurance purposes. Uh, and, and so they think that the crime situation is under control when in actual fact what we've got is people doing things for themselves because they can't rely on the very expensive police force that we've got who don't seem to be able to lock up criminals. Yeah, and with um, Labour having we've got the least incarcerated number for some while when they had the tag and release system and no matter what you do we don't want anybody to be doing something that will get them arrested and cause jail time. The only people they want to send to jail are soft targets so that they can make a lesson to the, who is it? White males. Yes. Middle aged probably. Probably. All right, uh, Paul uh, I've got to go to the next call. Thank you very much for calling into Cam's Buddies, and we'll talk again next week. Okay, bye for now. See you. Good evening, Jack. Welcome to Cam's Buddies. Good evening, Cam. So uh, we've had a week to think about the budget. Um, what are your thoughts? Good, bad, ugly, indifferent? Any other adjective you'd like to describe the budget with? Do you recall um, before the election asking your buddies to come up with a list of people that they would have doing this? Yep. You may you may recall that I, do. um, I didn't give her much credit. Everything I said then, I haven't changed a bit. She's out of the debt. I mean, yeah. I don't know. Don Brash must be looking at her and thinking, oh, my God, what have we got here? You know, until I, – I, I hate to say this, but until we get a capital gains tax in this country um, – Wash your mouth doing, out. Wash your mouth out. I know, I know, but unfortunately it's required because I can't name one single colleague of mine that's ever made any money that hasn't been made via transactions on house sales. They've never made it through their businesses. It's always been on property. And I tell you what, until we sort that out, this country's not going to go ahead. Yeah, Um, trouble... The trouble with capital gains tax is if it was such a grand idea, it would work, right? But it doesn't work anywhere in the world. It doesn't work in Australia. It doesn't work. uh, It doesn't work in Australia. 
Oh, I mean, I've can I've experienced it in Australia when I lived in Australia. There's so many ways to get around it. It's not funny. Um, the capital gains tax uh, sounds like a grand idea until you try and put it into practice. Uh, most people in New Zealand mm. own one house. Um, it's their family home, and that would be exempt. And so you, you're now dealing with maybe a thousand people in New Zealand who trade um, properties. They'll find a way around it. They always do. The, the, the thing is, is that people who are wealthy, who do these sorts of things, are smarter than any politician and smarter than any civil servant. So it'll never work. The easiest way to do taxation is is exactly what we've got, which is GST on everything. Yep, well, that's the other thing you could do. Yeah. But, you know, but then we get wonky politicians who want to have exemptions for things. Yeah, you know, and GST. Oh, we've got yeah. to exempt cauliflower. And, oh, we've got to exempt raw chicken. No, not cooked chicken. You know, it just becomes farcical. Yes. Oh, well. Was there anything anyway, in the budget but, that you were happy with, though? No, nothing. Not one thing. Not one thing. Not a single in fact, thing. It was so in fact, I couldn't even, I don't think, uh, to be fair, I even looked into it too deeply because I didn't expect anything to come out of it. Right. But um, reading the promises and what she delivered, she hasn't delivered on anything that I can see. Right. So your assessment, I, your adjective would be bad and ugly. Well, bring back Don Brash or, or one of his cohorts. Well, not Adrian Orr, that's for sure. No. Hmm. He doesn't well, seem to have a clue. He'd, he'd be better than Nicola Willis, I think. Hmm, that's marginal call. Maybe we can have a call about that one. All right, uh, yeah, Jack. Sure. I'll let you. I'll let you go. To Sorry to be. You don't need to apologise. So cynical, but that's the way it is. Well, you've been around for a long time, and you're you're entitled to be cynical. Yep. Okay. <laughs> See you later then. All right. Thanks, Jack. Thanks for calling, Cam's buddies. All right. You can always rely on my buddies for truth bombs, and we certainly heard some there about the budget. Tell us your thoughts on Cam's Buddies by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thanks for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. Do you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to? Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We'd love to hear from you, so connect with us today.